Wow, exciting stuff. Those were some amazing keynotes that happened. Uh, you can't escape deep learning, like no matter what conference that you go to nowadays. Um, and I'm really pumped up for Spark Summit. Uh, I like the diversity in perspectives when people talk about like how they are using Spark to solve their organization's problems. Uh, how many people are attending their first Spark Summit? Wow, quite a few. I remember my first Spark Summit, like this was back in June 2014. Uh, they were just coming out with Spark 1.0 at that particular time. And back at Netflix, we were doing everything on a single box, like all the machine learning related infrastructure was on a single box. And, uh, but the real thing that excited us about, us about Spark was the interacted, interactivity it provided in data analysis, data exploration related tasks, and also the whole ecosystem of notebook that it gets along with that. Um, I'm a machine learning engineer at Netflix in the recommendation system. And today I'll be talking about how we are building machine learning infrastructure at Netflix with an experimentation first design philosophy and how Vegas, uh, a Scala visualization library that we build specifically for the notebook case is a crucial component of that ecosystem. I'll just wait for 30 seconds for other people to trickle in. So for people who don't know about Netflix, it's a streaming service that allows people to watch on-demand TV shows and movies for a small subscription fee. And a lot of the viewing or watching on Netflix is driven by recommendations. And the whole, every aspect of the recommendation experience at Netflix is machine learned. So here are screenshots on how recommendations look like on the Netflix experience. Um, so as soon as you log in to Netflix, like you'll see a home page where you have recommendations for movies and TV shows. These, has be, these have been crafted uniquely for every member based on their viewing experience and their de demographic information. A lot of signals go into play in generating these recommendations for them. So this is how the homepage looks like. And as soon as you switch to a kid's profile, this is how the kid's profile look like. And on mobile, like Netflix allows you to download movies. So if you go on the downloads tab, even the movies over there are sorted based on the, based on the probability uh, that you will play them with. So what makes the recommendation problem at Netflix even more challenging is that Netflix is present in more than 190 countries right now. There are more than 100 million paid members. So you have to generate recommendations uniquely based on people with different cultural tastes and different genre tastes that are there. Uh, the Netflix experience is available on different devices. Think about like all of the mobile devices, gaming consoles, or smart TVs. Everyone has either a smartphone, either an app or a client uh, through which you can consume Netflix. <coughs> this is how um, the homepage looks like for any given user. And if you see, like there are different components of, of the homepage. Like you can see billboard, continue watching, and different rows over there. So each row on the Netflix or each component on the homepage is powered by its own recommendation machine learning algorithm. And on top of this, there is another page construction meta algorithm that lies, which reorganizes these rows and columns in, in a way such that users are most likely to stream. And after having done net machine learning at Netflix for eight to nine years, uh, people might remember the 2008-2009 Netflix prize that drove a lot of 
research and recommendations at that particular point. So since then, having done machine learning, we, felt, we feel that we have been spending a lot of our time in the experimentation use case rather than the production one. And with experimentation, I mean everything that you do before you actually decide like what are the features you want to use and how you'll train the model. So all the kind of exploration, opportunity sizing that you have to do. So as an example, like say a product manager comes to us and says that we want to improve recommendations for non-English non speakers. Then we go ahead, explore the data, try to do opportunity sizing, try to understand, <coughs> try to see anything that we do in this particular space, like what is the impact that, uh, that any algorithm modification that we would do. Once we explore the data, we also have a good idea of like, what are the signals or features we could use to train a model. Once you identify the features, we go ahead, train a model, evaluate the model. If the model looks good, then we go ahead and share the finding with colleagues and product managers. Otherwise, there's a dotted line from here. We go back to the drawing board, try to identify if there are any more features that we could try, and then do the small sub-loop back again to come out with a model where we feel that the metrics on past data have improved for the population that we wanted to improve. <coughs> and once we have a good model, then we share the findings through a notebook or something where like colleagues and product managers could take a look at how things have improved, like how the recommendations are changing in the newer model that we are trying. And at that particular time, like people might come out with some feedback and suggest us some different things to do, and then we try to do the loop again a couple of times till we have a good enough model that we know would surely work in an online A-B testing setting. And what we have seen is that since we have been spending a lot of time in the experimenter phase, what works really well is notebooks. And with notebooks, I mean IPython, Jupyter, or Zeppelin kind of notebooks. Uh, these are optimal for experimentation. Uh, they also provide a good way of sharing reproducible research with your colleagues, product managers, like business folks, and give them a good idea of how things are improving. Also, right now with notebooks, like you're able to do an end-to-end -end ML experiment, so you could execute the whole thing from data preparation, feature generation, model training, model evaluation, and see how the results look like. And then if you get any more feedback, it's totally possible to go back, tweak the hyperparameters, or add additional features, just rerun the notebook and see how that looks. So, the rerunning, the experimental loop like happens a lot in the notebooks use case. And if you see like the Python ecosystem has got the notebook use case like perfectly well executed. I mean, if you go on the web and search for IPython notebook gallery or IPython notebooks, you'll see a lot of these beautiful notebooks with great visualization like great model training related examples and how you can tweak small things and rerun the entire algorithm again. And there are mainly two reasons why uh, like the notebooks are so popular in the Python ecosystem. Like first of them is a well-known or well-reputed like well-adopted machine learning computing library is already present. Like people know that NumPy is the way to go to store the data. And on top of that, you have SciPy, sklearn, pandas, and all of these different computing libraries that provided easy to do an end-to-end -end experiment. And on top of these computing libraries, there's also a huge catalog of visualization libraries that are present in Python like mainly matplotlib, seaborn, bokeh. In fact, the problem on the Python side is like people are always confused about like what is the best visualization library that I could use for this visualization task at hand. On the Scala notebook ecosystem side, like the ecosystem is slightly broken over there. And um, one thing was about the 
computing library, uh, library related issue, but that gap is filling up, like MLlib is coming out with newer algorithms. Uh, there are also a lot of companies like Uber, LinkedIn, and a lot of the other tech companies, they have been open sourcing their machine learning frameworks and algorithms, which is making it much more easier on the computing library side. The main friction point right now on the Scala notebook side is visualization. Like, there's no one single visualization library that people have decided and feel that, uh, that they could use on the Scala side of things. Zeppelin provides some way of doing it, but that's filled with a lot of friction, and you have to have the data in the right format before you, before you have, to, uh, have to get uh, Zeppelin to visualize it for you. And that's why we built something that we call as Vegas. It's a visualization library in Scala that we specifically built for the notebook use case. And uh, it's mainly a Scala wrapper on a JavaScript library called as Vega Lite. I'll talk about Vega Lite subsequently. But this is a crucial component for us because it solves the visualization issue. Uh, for us when we do an end-to-end -end Scala machine learning experiment. Uh, because earlier, the way we used to do is like we would do an end-to-end -end ML experiment, then store the data somewhere in Hive, would fire up like R or Python notebooks, and then use one of the libraries over there to, to visualize that particular data. And that was like filled with lots of friction for us. So what is Vegas? So Vegas is a library that's written in Scala. It provides a declarative API. With declarative, I mean contrasting it with an imperative API in the sense that it's a much more high-level API where you tell what you should do with the data rather than telling it how you should do it. <coughs> it's statistical. With statistical, I mean that uh, the data is assumed to be in a tabular format. And uh, usually the job or the way the API works is you point to one column and say, OK, this is my x-axis. You point it to uh, the other column and say, this is my y-axis. And that's how you plot the stuff. In addition to that, um, you, there is also support for operations like filtering the records in the data. Aggregation, you could do max, min, standard deviation, these kind of like basic operations. Uh, facetting, where you could basically segment the data for a particular column into different domain values and look at these charts side by side. I'll show you some examples of them. And on uh, top of that, like it provides a visualization grammar. So it endorses or espouses this concept of grammar of graphics. It's a concept that was popularized by uh, Leland Wilkinson, where the idea is that you can build a visualization library with small blocks, and then you can put these blocks together through which you can then eventually come out with complex visualizations. And these blocks are usually stuff like, uh, show me where is the data, and once you show where the data is, like if you want to do any transformations on top of that, there's a special API for that. Uh, scales like whether you want to have linear or log-related scales, then you need some support for the guides, which is uh, how the legends will be shown. And then, then there is this aspect of marks about what kind of, uh, what kind of chart that you want, like whether you want a bar chart or a graph chart or a scatter plot. So just in a very declarative way, you could use these things to have the complex charts that you want. Uh, one of the added bonus of uh, declarative visualization is like the, the interactivity that you get it for free in the sense that in Vegas, like you just declare like how you want the chart to be associated and Vegas then produces D3 code, but it infers like meaningful defaults on what kind of interactions that you want. Like, basically selecting a block of points and moving it like a brush. So these are the kinds of interactivity that you get for free with that declarative API. Uh, 
This is how a plot looks like in Vegas. There's the concept of channel, so everything is a channel. Like, uh, these are the Y and X channels, and usually the way you do that is saying that, okay, my X channel encodes this column of the data, my Y channel encodes this channel, uh, this dimension of the data, which is eventually a column in the data frame. And then you could do something like the shape channel, where you would want to segment the data or identify data coming from a separate column value by a different shape. So you say that I want the origin column to have its own shape, and then it just goes ahead and picks different shapes for them. Similarly, you could use the origin column to have different colors for it. Over here, I'm reusing the same column, but in a more real-time use case or a more production use case, you would be using different columns for shape and size so that people can have different visual cues to see how different dimensions of the data are interacting. And similarly, there is a size channel where if you point to a quantitative column, it will go ahead and and basically show the size of the shapes or infer the size of the shapes based on the quantitative bucket that that particular record falls into. Here's like, so here's the same chart that I showed in the previous slide, and this is like, this is the Vegas code that would be there to generate that chart. And if you see, so this is Cars DF is a Spark data frame which has these different columns. What you're actually saying is uh, generate me a chart where the data is coming from this data frame uh, and I want it to be a point or a scatter plot and my X is coming from this column. The horsepower, it's a quantitative column Similarly, Y is coming from miles per gallon, like this is the column for it. And then similarly, as you encode X and Y, you can also encode the color, where you would say that I want, to, I want records from a specific value of the origin column to take in a different color. Like this is what I meant by declarative in the sense that you don't have to say that you want those points in green, blue, or red. So that saves you writing a lot of code and that allows the underlying stack of Vegas to optimize what's right for you. So you just encode the color, size, and shape over here, looking at it in this particular fashion. Uh, so what does Vegas give you out of the box? So it supports most plot types, in the sense, as uh, similarly, like if you were to change this from point to bar, you would get a bar graph. So it supports bar graphs, it supports scatter plots. Similarly, you could change it to an area just by changing the mark for it. This is a stream graph, this is also supported in Vegas. And these are bubble plots that are very helpful for, um, for visualizing populations or different demographics of things. Uh, then there's this concept of trellis plots. So trellis plots are an interesting way if you want to visualize data and segment it from, segment the data based on a certain column, based on some domain values. So say I have this X and Y where you're plotting US DVD sales with worldwide gross, but you would want to segment this by like the MPAA rating. And this is how, so by just saying just pointing and saying that I want the trellis plots to be generated on this particular column, like in a single line, you'll get uh, these multitude of charts generated for different values of the column that you're interested in. Uh, Vegas also provides this concept of layering in the sense you could stack up multiple charts on top of each other to provide the right visual explanation that you want to. For example, uh, we have this bar chart over here, like where um, for a particular age bin, you want to see how much is the population. So this is the mean population for that particular age. And then you could have an area chart plotted on top of it where you're trying to get the Q1 and the Q3 quartiles for that particular data. 
So you could see the confidence interval, how does that look for that particular bar chart. And on top of that, you could have another chart which picks up just the maximum value to see where the outliers for that particular chart lie. So it's very powerful in terms of just keep stacking charts in to add additional information that you want about this particular data. Um, Vegas just works with the notebook, like that's the first use case that we built with. Like we use Zeppelin and Jupyter quite a lot at Netflix and uh, we know that Vegas works very well in those two notebooks. Uh, some people have said that they have also tried it using the Databricks Cloud and uh, they have had success with that particular thing. Um, Vegas also provides a way for showing uh, charts on the command line. So basically if you want to do something with file listing times or the size of the files, like Vegas is also a good option for something like that. It uses JavaFX technology to do that. Given that this is a Spark conference uh, and we work with Spark quite a lot, there is inbuilt support for Spark where you just say that my data is coming from a data frame, point it to the data frame, and then uh, because we have access to the data frame, like we can take a look at the metadata of the data frame, see what columns are present in it, like what is the type of the column, like whether it's quantitative or categorical, and then based on that, infer the right defaults and come out with a chart really quickly. Uh, okay. um, what time is it? One sec. Okay, yeah, cool. Um, these are other statistical functions that Vegas provides out of the box, like you get automatic binning, like you could pick up a particular column and say that I want to bin between these values or the number of bins that I want to have for this particular column. Uh, you can sort it to have the, the right kind of sorting for the x-axis or the y-axis. Scaling, whether you want to go for linear scales or log scales, you just give one term and it does the right thing. Uh, there's custom transformations that you could do. So in addition to all of this, you could also, like, Vegas has its own DSL where you can say that on this particular data, I want to transform the data in a specific way. This is very similar to how Spark does data transformations in the sense you could just add a new column to that particular data and use that column for plotting. So you could just say with column and then say that this column can be derived using this DSL expression. The support for time series and uh, date related data types. There's a lot of aggregation that you get out of the box, min, max, sum, average. You could filter the records before Vegas actually plots it. Uh, all of the JavaScript functions like log, tan, sign are also available when you want to do data transformations. Uh, you get descriptive statistics out of the box like Q1 quartile, Q3 quartile, standard deviation, variance, like these are things that you could just point to a column and say that I want these descriptive statistics and it plots those for you. Uh, just a quick one. So the way it works is you just specify your Vegas code in Scala in a notebook and then Vegas th then takes the specification that you have done, uh, generates an HTML out of it, and then renders it in, an, uh, in the notebook in an inline iframe. Um, so I wanted to highlight that Vegas is mainly a Scala wrapper on top of Vega Lite. This is the actual JavaScript library which is doing the heavy lifting. And uh, Vega Lite in, f uh, in turn sits on top of Vegas, which is a much more powerful, but at the same time much more imperative library. And Vega in turn uses D3 to do the visualization. So if you see as you go on the top, the API becomes much more uh, declarative, you lose some of the power that D3 gives you in terms of like getting the right pixel color or the right luminosity, but the amount of code that you want 
to write for 90% of the use case is like really small when you use Vegas. Uh, okay, I won't go for the examples. Okay, one second, I'll just give you. Uh, so this is how like Vegas charts look like in, um, in Jupyter. You just go ahead, uh, download Vegas, do a couple of imports, and then basically just go ahead and say, okay, generate bar chart. So over here, what you're saying is, I want this data where uh, the column A has these ordinal values and column B has more quantitative values. And then you just go ahead and say, this is encode X, encode Y, and these, uh, and it generates a chart for you based on that. And similarly, so, in my slide, I'll have a link for this notebook. This comes from our GitHub website. Okay. And so basically, just over here, you get to see like the different kind of charts that are present in Scala uh, in Vegas and the amount of code that is required to generate that. Okay. I think I have just five minutes remaining. Uh, do people have any questions? Microphone, if anybody has questions. Yeah. Uh, do you use Spark also for generating plots? I mean the situation when do you have a lot of rows and do you want to build a plot with points? And it takes a lot of time if you use only a single machine. Thanks. Yeah, uh, yes. So, most of the times, what we do is like we, uh, we take the Spark, massage it into the right set of, like we collect that particular data into a bunch of case classes, massage it in the right way we want, and then give it to Vegas and do it. The data frame use case is mainly for convenience. But internally, even for that particular one, like we'll go ahead and sample it to only 10,000 data points, collect that particular data, and visualize it over there. What is the level of control uh, in terms of uh, font size, colors, axis limits, things like that? Um, there, is, uh, there is a good amount of control in that particular one. Like, there are different encoding channels for scale, for axis, and what Vegas does is, is infers it much of the time, but you could always override it to the level that you want. I mean, you may not get D3 level flexibility, but whatever you want in the chart, or colors and text, like all those flexibility are present in Vegas, yep. I am um, just wondering, you mentioned at the beginning that you get an awful lot of interactivity with the charts. Would you have any examples of what, what that looks like? Oh, uh, in terms of interactivity, yes. Great that you ask. So th uh, this is something that is coming out in the next version of Vegas. Vega Lite already has that, where you could just go take a scatter plot and say that I want it to be interactive, and then just in a declarative way, like you have like a point interactivity where you just click on one of the points and it will give you the information for that particular point. You could also uh, select a certain, uh, like you could basically drag and drop a certain square and then move it just like a brush and see how uh, like points on that particular one get highlighted. Uh, you could point to a particular column and say that when I move to that particular column, I want only those set of points to be highlighted. So if you see this particular, this is the same chart. What we are so saying is highlight things based on the origin chart. So it would, you could just basically hover on it and, uh, and only those points get highlighted. Right, time for one last question. Uh, is it available for everybody uh, outside database, let's say, uh, the framework, the library? Uh, could you repeat the question? If Sorry. it's available uh, on any technology, not only in, with Databricks. Yes, uh, so we heavily use this on Jupyter and Zeppelin. So it works on that particular side of things. and. Uh, People have just told us that it works on Databricks Cloud, but we haven't really tested that. In fact, we use more on the open source notebook solutions. 
right, thank you very much for coming. Let's give Roger a uh, warm applause. Thank you.